Um, for reasons to do with a really cool workshop at ETH two years ago, a group of people got together and wrote a perspective piece on compound events. Um, and I was one of those people which now seems to translate into Middleissa thinking I know lots and lots and lots about compound events. I don't think anybody knows lots about compound events. They're new. They're a, it's one of those wonderful areas of research where if you want to catch up on the whole literature, it should take you about a day. So you can get on the bandwagon really early. There's not much work being done on this area. So I haven't suggested loads of reading you should do. If you're interested in this, have a think about it. Use those brains of yours, because your ideas and the thoughts that you might have are as legitimate and as relevant as anybody else might have. So think about some of the things I might say and see if they interweave into your own research projects, because if they do, it gets you right to the pointy end of the research, which is really cool. So I'm going to start with the definition. Um, there is no one definition of compound events. In the SREX report, the IPCC report on extremes, there's a slightly different definition of extreme events, so of compound events, which you can also read. And there's subtle differences between them. But basically, compound events are combinations of multiple drivers that include impacts on social or environmental systems. So a really big storm out in the middle of the ocean that doesn't really impact on very much at all, really doesn't count. We're particularly interested in events that have downstream effects on societal or environmental systems. So an important word that you're going to need to be aware of is risk. You all know what risk is. Uh, it is that combination of the probability of an event multiplied by its consequences. So you all know about probabilities of events. You've all seen that picture before. You all know that at the tails of the distribution, the probability is much lower than in the middle of the distribution and all that stuff. So you are, and in fact, atmospheric and climate science, oceanographic science is really good at understanding issues around probabilities of events. But consequences are much more interesting. So if you have a really big heat wave, that might lead to a set of consequences which really don't have a major impact. Because you spend your weekend on the beach, it's a nice set of warm days. Some of you who live in Canberra may not remember warm days. But for the rest of us, beach near UNSW, hint, hint, heat wave, beach, gorgeous, wonderful, no worries. But of course, sometimes heat waves are also associated with things like severe bushfires. So within the context of compound events, you need to map in your minds the probability of an event or events occurring. And I'll come on a little, in a little while to talk about whether an event can be compounded spatially, as in a set of coincident events spatially, or temporally, because both can actually lead to consequences that way exceed the impacts of any one event. But they also have to be taken into account in terms of consequences. So that's the basic background of compound events. I'm now going to sort of start at the beginning and scaffold an argument if I can. So you all know that the planet is warming and the amount the planet will warm into the future depends on human activity. That is the difference between the mean global temperature under high emissions and the global mean temperature under low emissions at 2100 depends on us. Actually, it probably depends more on you than on me, because we, my generation has been really ineffectual at dealing with that problem. You also know that you can describe that spatially. You can work, lots of us have worked for years, trying to understand things like the climate sensitivity and how much the planet will warm for a doubling of CO2. And the argument around compound events is that's really not very helpful. All that work trying to understand the mean global temperature, the trends in the mean global temperature, actually doesn't have any tangible consequences. Um, the President of the United States will not cut emissions because he hears that the global mean temperature is going to rise. He might, then again he might not, 
He might, if they understood that the consequences of global warming was a change in the probability of tropical cyclones sequencing across the Gulf of Mexico and stalling over Houston. They might begin to get a sense that the way that you translate global mean temperature into things that really matter to people is not how much it warms regionally, but how the weather in that place is expressed. So we're moving from understanding climate to understanding how weather emerges from that background climate. Because this stuff actually isn't where the rubber hits the road, climate scientists have moved in the last decade to worrying about extremes. And we're worrying about extremes because of all of the things that many of you have read. Biggest health threat of the 21st century, and there's some really cool numbers, uh, $24 trillion in funds management under companies that have signed disclosure acts according to threats and associations to do with climate change. In other words, the real world, the world of business, the world of medicine, have got a deep understanding that climate change is affecting their bottom line. We can also look at some work we did in the center. This is from Andrew King looking at the change in the risk of extreme heat events. When Andrew looks at extreme heat events, he looks at a univariable, a single variable. What will happen to extreme temperatures under future climates? And that was really cool. He got some, a lot of really cool papers as a consequence of that. But that isn't where the rubber hits the road. It's not about how a temperature will change. It's about how that temperature change is interwoven with the consequences of that temperature change and whether other factors compound to make a society or an ecosystem very vulnerable to that temperature change. So people in, this is a paper from Lisa Alexander, have taken uh, the issue of extremes further and teased out not just single days, but cold days, warm days. She's also looked at consecutive dry days, consecutive warm days, consecutive hot days. So we're now looking at a bit of a compounding, moving from a single hot event to sequences of hot events or sequences of cold events. Um, some of you who do any work at all around health impacts of heat waves will know that you can get a certain number of days in a row that are really hot and everyone's happy, get a couple more days, and it stresses the cardiovascular system to the very young and the very old, so you start getting a really high mortality rate. So it's not about the heat wave per se, it's about how long the heat wave lasts, how intense it is, and how frequent it is. A more complex metric than just how hot it's getting. So we've been moving in the climate community from the averages to the extremes and worrying about whether there'll be more hot weather, and particularly as the PDF changes, whether we start to see unprecedented hot weather. But I'm arguing this is a 20th century figure. That's not where things are anymore. It's where you get unprecedented hot weather interwoven with vulnerability, or systems lacking resilience, or unprecedented hot weather occurring for a longer period of time, or occurring somewhere where they haven't really seen that kind of extreme heat before. I'm sure you all know that a heat wave in England is typically above about 20 Celsius. Ah, it's actually about 25 Celsius. We shouldn't be too fussy. England puts out health warnings at about 27 degrees. If you put out health warnings in Australia at 27 degrees, you'd be putting out occasional health warnings about heat waves in the middle of winter. It's a completely different scale because of the way we have adapted and the way the Brits aren't used to warm weather. So we're now increasingly interested in up at this tail, but how that tail is interwoven with other circumstances that make people vulnerable. So one interesting question is how well our climate models simulate these things. So here is a picture that Lisa Alexander and Julie Arbaster produced, which they should have hidden away somewhere. Um, this is over Australia. This is, I think, the 99th percentile. Um, that is 
uh, observations, the black, solid black line, and the scatter around it are signet fire bombs. Now, I suspect that some of you working on temperature extremes for your PhDs, be careful, because if you're using CMIT-5 models to look at temperature extremes, I'm not absolutely convinced they are perfect yet. You might want to worry about this model or this model. Warmest night, there is a systematic bias. At least here, the average of all of those models would be something close to the observations. Not there. There is a systematic bias with the models struggling to do warm nights. It's warm nights that kill people. It's not allowing your cardiovascular system to recover overnight with some cooler weather that leads to the elderly and the young dying in a heat wave. Uh, one day precipitation, systematic bias, rainfall intensity, systematic bias. So we've got a bit of a problem here. Compound events are more than just the single variable extreme. They are about the combinations of extremes occurring simultaneously in time or space. And our climate models don't do the single variable very well. So if I want to know the probability of an extreme rainfall event occurring three days after a sustained drought, and I need to be able to simulate the extreme rainfall occurring simultaneously with the drought, and I can't simulate the drought or the extreme rainfall in my models, I've got a problem. And you might say we should therefore give up, except it's those combinations of events that cause the insurance industry stress, the superannuation industry stress, the medical community stress. It's what actually matters in the real world in terms of managing risk. So we've got to do something about it. And the short story is, at the moment, the really cool extremes, like droughts, like heat waves, like cyclones and East Coast lows, like flooding events. This is where, though you know, Stephen Gray lives. Um, not actually literally here. Um, he, as a good card-carrying, climatey person, he bought a property up on the hill. Lesson to be learned. Uh, this is from New Delhi, where the road liquidated, uh, liquefied, sorry. Um, this, uh, this is my favorite photograph, because one of, I'm not sure which, one of those boats is owned by the CEO of one of the big Australian insurance companies. I hope he was insured. Um, so, compound events, compound weather events, or compound climate events, are about combinations of things occurring sequentially or uh, simultaneously in time and space. They have multiple drivers. It's not a single event that causes damage. It's where you get combinations of drivers that lead to a significant societal or environmental risk. Um, so it's where things occur in sequence or occur simultaneously spatially. And they're particularly interesting, at least to me, where the resilience of a system is broken. So if you get an event that causes a little bit of inconvenience, not interested. I'm interested in those events that break the resilience of a system, and I'm going to talk about a few of those. So the sorts of things we're talking about, whoops, the sorts, eh, the sorts of things we're talking about are where you get a flood simultaneously with a storm surge, simultaneously with a high tide. Now that's not a good climate compound event because you can't blame the climate scientists per se for the high tide, although there's this sea level rise business that's changing the risk uh, quite rapidly. Um, and I'll talk about this one a little bit, cyclone, heat waves, and fire, because they turn out to be connected. Conditions that are hot and dry. You can get extremely hot weather when it's not very dry, but typically, if you're getting extremely hot weather and it's dry, it will be hotter than it otherwise would have been. And issues around things like heat waves, infrastructure, and health. Some of you will have seen the great photographs of Victoria where the railway lines buckled under, under heat waves. You might have heard in the newspapers, even though it's only going to be 27 or 28 degrees in Britain, um, they're slowing the trains down because they're worried that the railway lines will buckle. There we go. Uh, um, 
A lot about compound events are linked to combinations of the large scale state, which is why I showed you those earlier pictures of the overall trends in global temperature. It's not that that stuff's not important or not relevant. Don't, don't go away today saying, I said, you don't need to worry about the global mean temperature. The global mean temperature and the, the distribution of that global mean temperature in space leads to a change in the large scale state that changes the behavior of the weather. So it is important, but translating that behavior of the, of the weather into these kinds of things is where we're at. So here's an example, Russian heat wave. I'll give you some more statistics on the Russian heat wave because it was a heat wave that makes heat waves in Australia look lame. Um, these are the set of conditions that are coincident with that heat wave in Russia. It starts well before the heat wave occurred. It was dry in spring. There led to, that led to a summer drought, and coincident with that was a set of synoptic conditions that allowed an exceptional heat wave to develop. I suspect if it had rained a lot in spring, you wouldn't have got the conditions that led to the drought that led to the conditions conducive to the heat wave. Even though you had the synoptic conditions, if it had been nice and wet over Russia, I suspect you would not have got this heat wave to the same conditions you got. So it needed two things. It needed the pre-season dryness leading to a summer drought coincident with a set of synoptic conditions. That led to an exceptional heat wave. And that killed people, quite a lot of people. Coincident with that, is this heat wave led to a higher probability of wildfires that killed people. And that led to, the wildfires led to major um, air pollution events across Russia, uh, which killed people. And it also led to major agricultural losses, which killed more people. You ended up with a combination of things that each in isolation would have been manageable, but they compounded not additive, not linearly, but exponentially compounded to lead to a catastrophe. And you didn't read very much about the catastrophe because it wasn't in the US or Europe. There have been worse events than this occurring in India and Pakistan that you will have to go and hunt down in the newspapers to find reported. If they had occurred in Europe, there would have been mass panic. Um, an important thing about these is these can't be taken in isolation. If you study droughts, but don't look at the synoptic conditions, you can miss things that would offset that drought or amplify that drought. It was about these things occurring in combination. And once this one occurred, once that low spring rainfall occurred, it changed the probability of that exceptional, rainfall, uh, exceptional heat wave quite dramatically. So you can't focus in on the heat wave in Russia without looking at the precondition, preconditions that led to a substantial change in the risk or the probability of that occurring. So there's actually been some analysis of, of this. Um, I'm now going to test Annette Hirsch's pronunciation. How do you pronounce his name? Zerschler. Pardon? Zerschler. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> too many non-vowels in Zerschler uh, and Senevaratne published this rather nice paper last year in Science Advances. It's one of about three papers worth reading in this area, I think. And they basically looked at not the probability of extreme temperatures, but how much did the probability of extreme temperatures change if there was a dry period leading into that um, into summer, so pre-heat wave rainfall conditions. And they see a change in the likelihood of about a doubling. So if you're a synoptic meteorologist and you're interested in heat waves, you've got to look at the antecedent conditions. You've got to look at how the soil moisture state and the evaporative transpiration state leading into that heat wave changes the probability of, um, of, a, of a heat wave event. So you've got to think about the event that you're interested in in the context of the broader picture. So because 
some really kind people produce eye candy. I'm going to show you another compound event. Ugh. I'm going to try and show you another compound event. Yeah. It does work. I've tested it. So this is a set of nice tropical, a set of tropical cyclones in the Gulf of Mexico. And we're wanting to look at the cyclone train. We're looking at how the cyclones follow something of a preferred path coming in here. And we're going to look at probably the most famous compound event we've identified to date, which is Harvey. Nice big cyclone. And it stops. I'll play it again in a minute. But basically, Harvey stopped. Cyclones don't stop. Cyclones come in through the Gulf of Mexico and then basically sweep north up over North America. So there's two things going on here. There's two really cool events. There's a cyclone train flowing through this region it, up into the Gulf of Mexico, bringing cyclone after cyclone into that region. And secondly, something weird happened to Harvey so that it didn't follow that same kind of trajectory where the cyclone is moving quite rapidly uh, and continues to move across the Gulf of Mexico and north. So I'll play it again so you can see Harvey, because Harvey is really interesting. Um, if you're into cyclones, which I'm not. As a land surface person, I feel very insecure about talking about the atmosphere. But <laughs> Harvey forms here in a bit. Honest. Ah, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. There we go. So it moves up, and it's moving, it's moving, it's moving. It's quite happily moving. It's moving slowly north. And then it stops, and it stalls over Houston. This was not demonstration of a deity trying to wash away the main fossil fuel capital of North America. There is no relationship between those two things at all. Am I going next? So that's one. There's two kinds of compound event occurring there. The cyclone trend, the cyclone track, where you get cyclone after cyclone sweeping across through the Gulf of Mexico into that region, that cyclone train changes the probability of two or three cyclones hitting a very similar place in the US dramatically. There's a synoptic conditioning that tends to trend cyclones in um, through onto the Gulf of Mexico and onto the US. It, it's a very fundamentally different probability of that region being hit by a cyclone than many other places where they are much more stochastic. And secondly, something weird happened with Harvey. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Another compound event are East Coast lows. Um, if you live in Sydney, you remember East Coast lows. Um, they hit the ha, East Coast. <laughs> And this is the catchment area for Sydney. So there's a dam, Boragamba Dam, here somewhere. Forgotten exactly where. Um, and it looks like that. And occasionally it overflows like that. And in uh, 2015, three East Coast lows hit the coast within a, about a month. One hit the south coast down around Wollongong. One hit Sydney and one hit much further north, north of Newcastle. What is the probability of those three East Coast lows following that kind of a cyclone trend, a uh, train, and all hitting the same place in Sydney? And the answer is no one knows the answer to that question. We do not know if that is possible or not. But if you get one East Coast low hitting Sydney, it's a good news story. It's good, because it fills the dams. If you get two East Coast lows hitting Sydney within a week of each other, it's a bit of a worry. You get some localized flooding. You get a dam really kind of really full. But you know, the world doesn't come to an end. If you've got three East Coast lows all hitting the same place within a month, the third East Coast low would hit Sydney when everything was saturated. The dam was completely full. And if you've ever driven out onto the Hawkesbury Plain, as you drive across the Hawkesbury Plain on the west of Sydney, you see these flood posts 
that go to three or four metres above the road. And that's how deep the water can get. Sydney's main development path for people is to build out here, in the region that's flooded, when that bursts. So it's a really important question, not what is the probability of an East Coast low, or will the probability of East Coast lows increase by 12% by 2050? Those are interesting, but not really the critical question. The critical question is, is there a risk of multiple East Coast lows co-locating within a period of time in a system that's been built to be as vulnerable as it could be to a sequence of events of that kind, both vulnerable because you built a very big dam there, and vulnerable because the main development strategy in Sydney is to build lots of houses just below the dam. So you're seeing a compounding risk here. We don't know meteorologically whether you can get three east coast lows hitting the same place, but these were really close. And we don't know if the reason these weren't hitting exactly the same place is the nature of the first one disrupts the atmosphere sufficiently that it precludes the next one forming in the same place, or whether this was dumb luck. It's a really interesting question to think about. We do know about this, though. These are temperature anomalies global from 20, 2010. And if you look, whilst everywhere's red because of the warming of the background state, you can see some really significant heat waves here, here over Greenland, here and here. These were not coincidental. These four heat waves were linked, connected physically by the, gulf, by the um, jet stream. So this is a sequential event in time. The jet stream formed in such a way that made multiple heat waves almost inevitable. They were not independent or stochastic. Uh, it got quite warm in Russia. Um, even people from Victoria would respect 53 Celsius. It cost half a billion. And a little while later, a few weeks later, led to some of the most severe flooding that's been in, seen in Asia. 20 years ago, we'd see those as independent, and the consequential flooding that occurred over Asia some weeks later would have been a stochastic event, an independent event. But we're now seeing some of these extreme events not being stochastic. They are connected physically um, by the way the atmosphere organizes. Um, that is a big deal if you're an insurance company. If you're an insurance company and you price risk and you assume each major risk is independent, the statistics by which you assess that risk and you price that risk is profoundly different than if you know a heat wave here will be occurring coincidentally with a heat wave here. And the only reason this didn't have a big impact on um, the insurance companies is if you look carefully, it basically occurred where people don't have insurance. That was luck. Uh, this is a famous one by Tess Parker and Michael Reeder. Um, those of you who know me will know that what I can tell you about potential vorticity anomalies, you could write on the back of a postage stamp. So it's not my area at all. But Michael Reeder and, and Tess Parker did some really cool back trajectory modeling which linked heat waves in Victoria to the cyclone, tropical cyclone activity in northern Australia. So the basic idea that Mike, Michael Reeder explains it to me in, in language that a land surface scientist understands is up here you've got lots and lots of air moving vertically upwards. And the papers about tropical cyclones shifting potential vorticity upward, but deep convection seems to have much the same effect. So lots of air rises in the tropics, it gets swept anticyclonically around the continent and is dumped over Victoria. And the uh, adiabatic warming associated with the sinking atmosphere leads to uh, a much warmer temperature than you otherwise might get. Those of us in the land surface think there's links with soil moisture and the, uh, the moisture or the surface energy balance associated with the airflow. Michael is not convinced by that. 
Um, and there's some really cool work to do to tie together whether the surface energy balance links with this kind of a thing, not to explain why we get heat waves, because I think Michael's nailed that, but to look at whether that intensifies heat waves. This is an interesting compound event. Over Victoria, extreme heat waves can be uh, coincident with fire. Over the northern Australia, tropical cyclones are associated with damage. Australian insurance companies insure against cyclone, and they insure against fire. Emergency services reacting to this kind of a thing in the north by shifting their resources northward to help with the disaster could be shifting their resources away from Victoria a few days before you start getting serious fires. Because these things are not stochastic. They are not independent. They are connected and it changes the risk profile and the pricing of risk when it comes to how insurance companies deal with it because they still see these two kinds of things as independent. So this is the way I'm beginning to think about compound events. You have a mean trend in temperature. The background climate is changing. That's really interesting and it's really kind of 30 or 50 years of climate science to understand this basic trend in temperature and where it's going to head. But it's not actually, I think, where the science is at anymore. We kind of know the planet's going to warm. It's going to warm by an amount. I'm interested in how that warm is expressed as synoptic patterns and how those synoptic patterns feed into key meteorological phenomena like blocking to lead to a profound change in the probability of heat waves. And then, my particular interest, is how land surface processes intensify that heat wave. I don't think heat waves are caused by the land. I think heat waves are caused by synoptic patterns. But I do think the land could intensify some of those heat waves. So the things are beginning to get connected. We also have the, um, exact ex uh, the, the example of compound events in the form of Cyclone Harvey, or Hurricane Harvey. There will be some background signal, background impact on Harvey associated with the warming trend. There have been detection attribution studies done showing that some of those cyclones coming through the Gulf of Mexico are more intense as a consequence of the warmer ocean temperatures. These are the warmer ocean temperatures above normal, about a degree above average. That will have had some impact on on. The, um, on Harvey, but that wasn't the key issue. Harvey stalled over Houston, and it stalled over Houston because of the synoptic and the jet stream patterns over North America. So Harvey in itself wasn't such a big deal. It wasn't a particularly intense cyclone. What made it catastrophic was the patterns of the jet stream and the synoptic situation over North America that allowed it to be blocked and sit quietly over Houston, dumping vast amounts of water. This is a compound event. Without the blocking pattern, Harvey would have never been remembered. With the blocking pattern, it changed from a normal behavioral tropical cyclone into something that cost lots of money. And it's that combination of things that we have to start getting into our models. So how are we going to do that? Well, you know about climate models. Um, if, you went, if you've ever listened to Christian, you know that they're based on laws of physics. They're kind of complex. I think that's an exaggeration. I think the latest version of Access is more like 2 million lines of code. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, IPCC call climate models robust tools at continental scales and above. They do not say climate models are really cool for figuring out how much it will warm over your house in Melbourne continental scales and above. And I don't think they're fit for purpose for the sorts of extremes I'm talking about today. I, I suspect you can tease out of climate models what will happen to extreme temperature with some skill. But when you're looking at the coincident probability of multiple drivers that have to occur sequentially in time or coincidentally in space, I don't think they work. I think they are far too coarse a resolution. I can actually kind of prove that they don't work by showing you that slide I showed you earlier, which kind of says maybe they don't work very well for the kinds of things we're talking about today. 
So what are we going to do about that? Well, Houston, uh, the cyclone Harvey that hit Houston was forecast. It was forecast to form as a cyclone. Its track was forecast. And the fact it stalled was forecast about three days in advance by U US uh, weather services. We can simulate those things now. And we can do them really quite well. The weather services around the world are actually amazingly good at taking a bunch of equations and a load of data and producing incredible forecasts. So weather forecasts do capture these compound events. They do so because they're provided with initial conditions and they assimilate information. They produce ensemble forecasts. They do a good job at capturing the synoptic scale. And everything that's going on in the background state pr is provided by the initial conditions and the updates to those initial conditions by the data assimilation. So it's not that we can't simulate these things. We can simulate these things. The only problem is that the global systems that do this are running at a slightly higher resolution than the 100 by 100 kilometer global models. And just at the moment, running global climate models at nine kilometers is just not going to happen. So we can't run our global models anything like that resolution. But it's not that it's technically impossible to simulate these things. We can simulate them if we have the tools to do so. So in terms of climate models, these run far from their initial conditions. They really don't capture the subtleties of the synoptic scales very well. They develop background states that are different from observations. Anybody want to guess what the range? If, you, if I asked you, take the CMIT-5 climate models, how different is their mean global average temperature, plus or minus, from the observed? How much do you think the IPCC CMIT-5 models, global mean temperature varies from the observed. We kind of know the observed is, what, about 15 degrees? So it's about plus or minus 2 degrees. So the CMIT-5 models vary from the observed plus or minus 2 degrees when we're trying to simulate trends over a century of a degree or two. So be careful how much you believe the global climate models. Um, but the critical thing is the detail of the connection from the large-scale state to the regional scales and the expression of those regional scales in forms of synoptic patterns or the connection between things like deep convection in the tropics through to heat waves over, over Victoria, there are severe limits to how well the global climate models running at 100 by 100 kilometers can do that. Our next generation Australian global model will run at roughly 100 by 100 kilometers. The one after that bleh, might run at more like 50 by 50 or 40 by 40. The general rule of thumb seems to be we've got to get down to about 20 kilometers. And I need a bigger computer. Why does it keep doing that? So options. It stopped. Excellent. <laughs> options. Um, if you want to study compound events, you've got to get to higher resolution. You've got to get to clear, properly synoptic scale spatial detail. And there are ways of doing that. There's, I think it's every time I touch that button. I'll stop touching that button. Um, Access S. Uh, which is a version of the access model run out of the Bureau of Meteorology uh, for seasonal predictions, runs at 60 kilometer resolution, might be a bit coarse. I didn't touch anything. <laughs> Not a subtle hint that my time's almost up, is it? Um, you said. Um, I wonder if that's going to say. So look carefully at the picture on the bottom left before it disappears. Um, there are versions of the access model that run much higher resolution. 
uh, 25 kilometers, uh, research versions at 12 kilometers, simulations over cities at higher resolution. Um, there's also things like WARF. You can run these models at much, much higher spatial resolution. Yes, they are computationally expensive. In fact, they're computationally crippling if you're trying to run them for long periods of time. But they exist. It's not that it's technically impossible. Um, the other option, if you actually need the whole global system and you want to run for longer, is the simple challenge of building a climate model that runs at very high resolution, which shouldn't be too hard. We need very high resolution and we need very large ensemble sizes. We're doing the probability of sequential or coincident events, right? We want to work out how often those might occur in the future. Something like three sequential East Coast lows. What is the probability of that occurring? You can't run for 20 years and say it never happened. You've got to run for longer. In Australia, I think the insurance companies insure earthquake for a 1 in 10,000 year event. I think it's 1 in, what, one in 10,000 year event. If we ask the question, could three East Coast lows hit Sydney sequentially within a month, once in 10,000 years, I think you'd be very brave to say no. So there's a complete disconnect in the insurance company between what they insure in terms of risk in meteorological hazard and geophysical hazard. And we're trying to educate them on that. So all we need to do is have a very high resolution model that we can run for very long periods of time, very, very large ensembles, and that's kind of challenging. But not impossible. Um, no, I did that by intent. Yeah. I've got another video. This is really cool. If it works, it'll be even cooler. I don't know if I can make that bigger. Uh, this is ICON. It's built by the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And they spent quite a lot of time building this model. Um, this is now five kilometer cells globally running. Those are not observations, that's simulation from a climate model. Um, and that's at five kilometers, which is pretty cool. Um, and rather beautiful. I think it makes astronomers look very second rate. Um, and in a minute, we zoom in. I think. Come on. Right. Now we're running at two and a half kilometer resolution. And this is just looking at one part of the planet, just off uh, South America, running their model at two and a half kilometers, which is really pretty cool. Doesn't seem to be moving very much. Now we're moving to 1.25 kilometers. Same modeling system, same uh, basic software. Uh, that's 4 million cells per atmospheric level, so it's getting to be a bit expensive. And now we've embedded a um, much more complex model, uh, coming down to 300 meters. Um, gets a bit silly after a while. But you can do this. The Germans have done it. Um, they can't get through the knockout, into the knockout stage of the World Cup. <laughs> but they can build really impressive models. So it's not that it's impossible. So it's just really hard. And it needed a major effort by Max Planck Institute in Germany, working with lots of others, working very intensively with supercomputing organizations. The GFDL in the US is doing much the same. They have a whole infrastructure around building the next generation or two. They're not going to be doing CMIT-5 models at two and a half kilometers. Don't interpret me as suggesting that. But they are moving to synoptic resolving scales, maybe global 20 kilometers, global 10 kilometer tight resolution. So it's not that it's impossible. It's that it's really hard. Um, given it's really hard, there is an option C. If you want to know the mathematical probability of three East Coast lows hitting Sydney within a month, I don't think we can tell you that right now. We might be able to if we work hard and do lots of cool science, but we can't do it right now. But the question is, is it impossible? And if it's not impossible, 
it's worth planning for, it's worth building resilience against, it's worth the insurance companies pricing in that kind of a risk. And if we can't give them the mathematical probability of it, maybe we can form a narrative around what is and isn't plausible. So can we definitively show that because of the way the atmosphere and ocean connect, you do get cyclone trains, but you couldn't get east coast low trains? Does the formation of an east coast low perturb the ocean atmosphere coupling in such a way that you'll get another one, but it will be in a different place? It cannot sequentially occur over one place. I don't know. But if we can definitively say it's non-physical and advise in, uh, insurance companies of that, that's very different from us saying, yep, it's physical, it could happen. And we can begin to form storylines of events that can occur that need to be planned for. That happens all the time in the military. It happens all the time in disaster planning. They do scenarios that are very unlikely but plausible. And they plan for them. And we might need to build some of those scenarios for the kinds of organizations we work with to give them plausible but very unlikely sets of compound events that they need to be concerned about. Um, traditionally, that has happened by people in the climate science community saying what they think is plausible. And I am trying to break that because I don't think that works because we don't actually know what planners, insurance companies, superannuation companies care about. We're trying to get them to tell us what breaks their system. We're trying to get a superannuation company to tell us what they're really frightened about. Surprisingly, they don't want to tell us. Not really big surprise on that. If we can understand what meteorological circumstances would break the resilience of a farming system or an infrastructure system or, or whatever it is, maybe we can tease out some of the attributes of those and work out some of the antecedent probabilities for some of those things and begin to put risk on some of those things, rather than just saying what we think might matter. Uh, the, but the point at the end is important. Um, it's very, very rare that a single univariable event breaks the resilience of a system. It does happen, but normally it's a combination of things that seem like bloody bad luck. But in the case of heat waves and cyclones, it's not bad luck. It's a physical, physical connection in the climate system. So there's a picture. Um, in, the, in a paper that came out in Nature Climate Change recently that you can go look at, which tries to capture all of this stuff. It puts risk at the center of the sorts of things we might be interested in and builds around that climate forcing, meteorological forcing, vari natural variability, whether there's a trend in the background state, all feeding in, all combined to feed into risk. And risk can only be thought about in the context of how governance, how adaptation, uh, how socioeconomic pathways have all been interwoven. Now, if you've ever done geography, this will be quite familiar to you. This is a reinvention of things geography is worried about for um, about a century. The difference here is we need to quantify this, either probabilistically or statistically or deterministically using the tools that we might have available to us right the way from the physical modeling down to um, the, the, the governance type models that prevent systems from being broken. So, summary, um, compound events are emerging as a real threat. It turns out that almost every time a big insurance company takes a major hit and you tease out what the causes of that major hit were, it's very rarely a single univariate forcing. It's a combination of things that has led to an event that's a compound event. They're poorly understood. Um, our climate models, I don't think, do them. We need the next generation of climate models. If you build them in the next few years for me, I'd appreciate it. Um, and in the meantime, I think narrative, storylines provided to stakeholders might, in fact, be a much more defensible way forward. Um, and that might help us assess 
some of the risks of extreme events and help um, enable assessment of some of the emerging compound events. But I want to just leave you with a little story. Everybody know what one of those is? A swan. In the 1700s and 1800s, ornithologists, people who are interested in birds, knew that all swans were white. There had never been a non-white swan observed. Every swan ever seen was white. Therefore, all swans were white. And then Australia was discovered. And they discovered a black swan, which was just unacceptable. <laughs> and the insurance industry and similar risks have coined the term black swans. And a black swan is a highly improbable event with three principal characteristics. It's unpredictable. It carries massive impact. And after the fact, we concoct an explanation that makes it appear less random and more predictable than it was. In other words, we reinvent history to explain away the fact we completely and unambiguously failed to predict what really mattered. 9-11 was an example of that. If you assess the probabilities around 9-11, it, um, it was unpredictable. But after the event, people found all of these things that had all those things been put together, it would have been obvious that it was going to happen. And that's just reinventing history to suit the purpose of failing to predict something that other people cared about. So there's a book by Taleb called The Black Swan. Um, it's a really great read for the first few pages, then it becomes tiresome. But the first few pages are really good. And it's worth reading because we are now talking about can we give information on the risks and the probabilities of sequential or uh, spatially coherent risk that is occurring very rarely that has huge consequences. And a lot of the evidence is, no, you can't. You, we will not be able to do this deterministically by modeling. And we might need to use our brains to come up with those storylines of plausible sets of circumstances that lets us predict when those black swans might come. Thank you. Question. Uh-oh. <laughs> So the answer to the first question is yes, and the second question, I don't think I did. I, I, you have those arrows, right? They're, they're connecting, they're not amplifying. Okay, so when you, when you tell that story, you, you can't actually say which is... No, no I don't. So in terms of, say, the agricultural consequences of that heat wave, um, it may well be the fires had no impact at all on the agriculture because it had already been killed off by the heat wave. I, I wasn't doing a sort of a sequential growing of impact. I was just pointing out that there was a lot of complexity to that event that didn't stop with the fact it was hot. I think so. Yes. So we are working in uncertainty here. Um, um, and I, I, I think we should embrace the uncertainty because I don't think we can necessarily resolve the uncertainty, especially in the very rare events. One of our huge problems is the rarer the event, typically the rarer the event, the more consequence it might have. Not always, but generally. And I think the biggest and rarest events are the least predictable. 
and that kind of compounds in a negative way that in the end you may not be able to say anything intelligent at all. But for the insurance companies, if you can't say anything at all, if we simply have to say it's a black box to us, we just can't tell you anything, that's actually useful to them. They, they, they're not unfamiliar with uncertainty. And what is dangerous for them is to wire in a risk that's gross underestimate of the risk. They're better off not including that at all because it tends to grossly underprice premiums. Um, so being able to communicate that we cannot tell you about the risk beyond a certain measure is not unhelpful. I mean, we like to get down to knowing something, you know, 95% statistical significance of this that we can write up in our journal climate paper. But that isn't kind of how the real world works. You mentioned the Max Planck and Jeff Yeldon doing high-end uh, climate models. Anybody else? What uh, does that really uh, So both Max Planck and GFDL are climate modeling groups, but primarily, and they are, are building versions of their model at very high resolution. There are a number of groups around the world, indeed, um, that do what are called unified modeling systems that go from weather prediction up to climate scales. The, the, the access model is, is being developed as one of those. So you can often run climate models at much higher resolution. The problem is the computational cost. But there are groups around the world that are building much higher resolution models. There is something called high resmit in CMIP6 where a number of models, I don't know offhand how many, are running at much, much higher resolution than the traditional climate models. Um, so high res myth is something to look at if you want further details there. So uh, I don't think anything I've said should necessarily put anybody off what they're doing because each of you is doing a little piece of the jigsaw and that's perfectly legitimate. But in producing your little bit of the jigsaw, it's a good idea to kind of know what picture you're trying to make. And if you're focusing in on change in the probability of TXX, which is the single hottest day of the year, it's a good idea to have in the back of your mind whether the way that that value emerges from the model you're using is physically reasonable and contains all of the drivers. So specifically in the case of extremes in the CMIT5 models, I don't think it's so much that they're wrong is I suspect they're a gross underestimate of how extremes can change at the upper tail because I think they are looking at a fraction of the drivers for how TXX will change, not the reorganization of synoptic situations that are conducive to a profound change. An example of that, and I won't get the numbers right, is Moree in northern New South Wales had an all-time record of, I've forgotten the numbers, but 10 days in a row over 35 Celsius. Now, climate models would say that should increase to six days in a row and then seven days in a row, then eight days in a row between now and 2050. Well, a couple of years ago, I think they had 28 days in a row. So it didn't change a little bit. It, it changed from one situation or one system to another and I don't think our climate models can necessarily capture how a change in the mean state changes the synoptic patterns 
to the degree that those feed into amplifying the initial changes from the, from the mean state. So I think our climate models lack that ability of the synoptic patterns to amplify the background forcing satisfactorily. And I can't prove that except to know that the example from Tess Parker, I, I just don't think there's any way that our current climate models capture the deep convection in the tropics, the PV anomalies, the tracking of the PV anomalies around the continent to dumping all of that over Victoria. They just don't do that. The weather forecast models do, but the climate models I really just don't think have got the skill to do that, and therefore they are missing something like how intensification of deep convection might trigger worse heat wave conditions over Victoria. So we're missing part of the story. And in the context of your question, when you're analyzing your results, and you should analyze your results in good faith, remember that you may not have all of the forcing on that variable properly resolved in the climate models. And therefore, do not write that this is what will happen in the future. You can cage that in terms of this is part of the story, but not, not being absolutely certain that that's what's going to happen, as I sometimes have written in the past. One of the, one of the problems in getting older is you have less and less confidence that you know what you're talking about. Uh, so I don't go back and read the conclusions of previous papers I wrote some years ago. I'm staying for morning tea, yes. Thank you again.